Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, the first in our series, we're going to be talking about a pretty important thing to be thinking about, and that is the employee retention credit for 2021. Um, so this is the employee retention credit that's applicable for this year. First things first, um, just take a quick dive back into the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. So that's what was signed into law back on March 11th. Um, it was a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Um, what the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 did for the employee retention credit, which I'll be referring to as ERC throughout the presentation, um, it extended the ERC through the end of this year. Originally, it was only extended through June 30th, so we've gotten um, the rest of the year added to this credit. It also extended eligibility for the credit, uh, which we'll talk about, and it clarified some of the exclusions when applying for other credits and or grants or loan programs, so we'll talk about that as well. And in addition, um, an important note, it also added a five-year statute of limitations um, for the IRS basically to be able to come back and review or audit this credit. Um, so that's really important when you're analyzing whether or not you are, um, you are eligible to take this credit. Just note that there is now a five-year statute of limitations in place so that the IRS can come back and take a look at it. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about whether or not you uh, qualify for the credit under the two different options. So the employee credit, uh, employee retention credit for 2021, it is different than the credit for 2020. Um, hopefully you've received our email and know that we'll be talking about the employee retention credit for 2020 tomorrow. Um, today we'll be focused uh, exclusively on the credit as it applies to 2021. So for 2021, it is a credit um, against the employer's share of social security tax, and it's equal to 70% 70, 70 of qualified wages paid to employees for this entire year, so January through December 31st. This is different from the credit last year. Last year, the credit was equal to 50% of qualified wages. So it's a larger credit this year, um, larger in a number of different ways. Um, the qualified wages for this year are capped at $10,000 per employee per quarter. Again, that's another change from last year. So the credit has the potential to be much bigger this year than it was last year if you were also eligible for it. The max maximum credit per employee per quarter is $7,000. So again, that's 70% of that capped $10,000 per employee per quarter qualified wages, um, or a maximum of $28,000 per employee per year. Um, eligible costs also include employer paid health insurance costs. So it's not only wages, you can also include those employer paid health insurance costs. And you file for the credit on form 941, which is the, which is the employer's quarterly federal tax return. Um, so if you do your payroll in-house, you, you, your uh, payroll processor in-house should know what the form 941 is. If you outsource your payroll to a third party, the likelihood is, is that third party is filing the form 941 for you. So you're going to make sure you're going to need to make sure that you're in constant communication with your payroll provider if you do outsource to a third party. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation as well. And new, um, as of the Economic Aid Act, uh, and again, um, reiterated in the American Rescue Plan Act, you can claim the credit even if you received a PPP loan this year, so in 2021, um, that it also applies to 2020, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. But it's important to note that you cannot use the same wages to apply for PPP loan forgiveness and also apply for the credit. Um, there are a number of other credits and programs that this applies to, but PPP and ERC have kind of been the, the two biggest programs that people have focused on. Um, so I wanted to make sure we address that right away. There is no double dipping, so um, some, some analysis needs to be done. So first question, are you eligible for the credit in 2021? Similar to last year, there are two ways that you can qualify for this credit. Um, the first one is that your operations were either partially or fully suspended due to a government mandated order, and that is specific to COVID-19. So if you are a restaurant and you were forced to actually be closed or you were forced to be at only 25% capacity, that would qualify you under this first way to qualify. 
The qualified wages, if you qualify under the business operation suspension, those qualified wages begin when the government order is put in place. So you will actually need to reference a specific government issued order that says that from March 1st through June 30th, your business was only able to be open at 25% capacity. You'll wanna make sure that you have that government mandated order um, in your file somewhere so that again, if the IRS were to come back and audit this credit, you have that information on file. The qualified wages under this way to qualify end when the government order is lifted. So for, for instance, we're here in Dane County, Madison, Wisconsin, um, the restaurant orders have shifted over the course of this last year. So you'll want to just make sure that you have all of the different government mandates on hand so that you can justify why you meet the criteria under this qualification. The second way to qualify um, is that your gross receipts in a calendar quarter are less than 80% of gross receipts in that same calendar quarter of 2019. Um, so I've had a lot of questions come back. Is that correct? Yes, you are comparing back to 2019. Essentially, we're looking back at a period that's quote unquote normal. Um, so we're not looking back at 2020. We are looking back to 2019. So you're comparing 2021 calendar quarter to calendar that same calendar quarter in 2019. If you meet this gross receipts decline test, um, qualified wages begin the first day of the very first quarter that you become eligible. So we're about to end first quarter here. First quarter will end uh, tomorrow. Um, so if you take a look at your gross receipts and you compare them in this calendar quarter compared to 2019, and let's say your gross receipts are 50% less than they were in 2019, so you do qualify for the credit. Um, the qualified wages begin on January 1st of this year, and they would end on March 31st. Now, you may be eligible for multiple quarters, um, so you would do the same test each quarter. I would like to make a note. There are some additional guidance. Um, there is some additional guidance that we're still waiting for in regards to the credit for 2021. One of those items is that you may be able to elect to compare um, the prior quarter to the current quarter to determine a decline in gross receipts, but we haven't gotten further clarification on that yet. Um, so we don't want anybody to rely on that being the test. For right now, the definition remains this gross receipts in a calendar quarter compared to that same quarter in 2019. Um, but just know that there will likely be more guidance as it relates primarily to the third and fourth quarter of this year, because that's what the American Rescue Plan Act extended the credit through third and fourth quarter of this year. So basically July 1st through December 31st of 2021. So a lot of the changes that were made um, or additions that were made to this credit in the American Rescue Plan Act are primarily going to apply to that third and fourth quarter. Um, so stay tuned for more information when we get new guidance. Um, the reality is we actually just got a lot of guidance on the employee retention credit for 2020 about one or two months ago, which ironically, um, you know, 2020 was already over. So there is quite a bit of catch up that we're playing in terms of guidance released. But these are the two main ways that your organization may or may not qualify for this credit in 2021. So one other update from the American Rescue Plan Act that I just wanted to highlight, um, just in case anybody on the call today uh, falls into this category. Um, they did make another category eligible, and these are recovery startup businesses, or they're also um, listed as RSBs. They are eligible to take the credit. If you're a recovery startup business, what that means is you started your business on or after February 15th of last year. Prior to um, the American Rescue Plan Act, those organizations that were not in business as of February 15th, 2020, were not eligible for a lot of the funding and the credits that were made available in the three stimulus packages released over this last year. So this is definitely um, has a lot of potential for organizations that started business on or after that date. Another one of the criteria is that you had to have no more than a million dollars in average annual gross receipts over the prior three years. I realize that seems a little bit counterintuitive considering that the 
business was to have started on or after February 15th of 2020. Um, that's what the guidance states uh, that prior three years, but essentially they had to have had no more than a million dollars in annual gross receipts. They also are not otherwise eligible for the credit due to that government mandated order or meeting the gross receipts test. Um, because it's part of the American Rescue Plan Act, and as I was just discussing, um, the American Rescue Plan Act made that extension for July 1st through December 31st of this year. Um, these recovery startup businesses are deemed eligible to receive the credit in third and fourth quarter of this year only. So this credit uh, is not, they're not eligible for the credit for the first two quarters of this year. Um, the maximum credit for recovery startup businesses is $50,000 per quarter. So one of the additional qualifications, um, and this is going to be different uh, between when we talk about 2020 tomorrow, but we want to talk about a large employer versus a small employer. So an employer that averaged more than 500 full-time employees in 2019 is considered a large employer. For those large employers, qualified wages are those paid to employees that are not providing services because operations were um, suspended or they meet the gross receipts decline test. So essentially what that means is for large employers, those that um, average more than the 500 full-time employees in 2019, you are only eligible to take the credit on those employees who you were paying but were not actually working. The other side of that is for small employers. So employers that average fewer than 500 full-time employees in 2019, qualified wages are wages paid to all employees. Um, so that is a, that is a difference. Um, that is something to be thinking about if you are a large employer. Um, and for purposes of ERC, a full-time employee means that the employee works at least 30 hours per week or 130 hours per month. This is different from things like PPP. Um, it may be different for some of the other programs, but specifically for the employee retention credit, that's the definition of a full-time employee. So if you're kind of on the cusp, you may need to do some calculations to determine if you're a large employer or a small employer. So how do you claim the credit? Um, there are a few ways that you can claim the credit. Um, ultimately, you are going to have to file the Form 941 and you will apply for the credit that way. Um, but there are a few ways that you can actually get the advantage of the credit. So you can reduce your employment tax deposits by the amount of your anticipated credit prior to filing Form 941. So it, depending on how large your payrolls are and how large your liability is, you may be a semi-weekly depositor, you may be a bi-monthly depositor, or you may be a monthly depositor of your Form 941 tax liability. If you anticipate that you're going to be eligible for the credit, you could be reducing those employment tax deposits by the anticipated amount of your credit prior to filing your Form 941. Small employers, so again, that's under 500 full-time employees, may request advance payment of the credit on Form 7200, which is a new form. It's called the Advance of Employer Credits Due to COVID-19 after reducing your deposit. So if you are really looking for cash in the bank and your employment tax or your anticipated credit is larger than your employment tax deposits and you'd like to request cash, a check, for the additional amount um, of the credit that you would receive, you can fill out a Form 7200. You would do, fill out a Form 7200 before filing your Form 941 for the quarter. Um, I'm going to show you an example of what the Form 7200 looks like so you have an idea of what you would need to be filling out there. If you didn't do either of these, which many people for first quarter may not have done, either reducing your tax deposits or filing the Form 7200, um, if you are not in dire need of cash at this moment, but you are eligible for the credit, um, you can just apply for the credit on the fo Form 941, um, and you can either apply that credit to the next quarter and reduce payments going forward, or you can actually request a refund of the credit when filing the Form 941. So in that instance, you would actually uh, request a refund and you would actually get a check back from the IRS for the total of that refundable credit. 
So here's an example of what the form 941 looks like. So again, this is the quarterly, um, the quarterly tax form that all organizations would be filing. I've highlighted a few areas here that you'll that are different now that we have these credits in place. So um, part one, line D, is the refundable portion of the employee retention credit from worksheet one. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, to note that there is an additional worksheet that you'll want to be filling out and I'm going to show an example of what that looks like on the next slide. Um, so there's a worksheet that will get you to the amount of your refundable portion of the employee retention credit. In addition, if you did file form 7200 and request an advance, you'll need to include that on your form 941. So again, these are things that you're going to be need to that <coughs> excuse me, you're going to need to be in communication with your payroll provider about because they're going to need this information to be able to file the first quarter 941 accurately and timely so that you don't have to go and file an amended return later. Then at the bottom, I've highlighted the section where if you do have an overpayment, which for most people, again, if you haven't reduced your tax deposits, you haven't filed for Form 7200 for the advance, you are likely going to have an overpayment. And here you can see where you can either apply that overpayment to your next return, which means that you can reduce your tax deposits in the next quarter, totaling the amount of your credit, or you can request that they send a refund. My advice would be that you apply it to your next return. This way you can reduce your payments going forward. If you request a refund, just know that refunds are likely not being processed as timely as most people would like. Um, the IRS is pretty backed up um, at, in all facets. So requesting a refund may take a little bit longer where that applying the overpayment to your next return will reduce um, your cash out of the bank right away by reducing your payments. So here's um, what the worksheet worksheet one looks like. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that this was actually included in the form 941 instructions. So if you um, search online for the form 941, you will not find this worksheet. You actually need to look at the form 941 instructions. And at the very bottom of the instructions is going to be this worksheet one. This worksheet one is not intended to be submitted with your form 941. Um, you'll notice at the top right, it says keep for your records. So this is an important worksheet that you'll wanna fill out and you'll just wanna keep on file. Um, this would be one of the items again, that if um, the IRS did come back and audit the 941, um, they would be looking for this worksheet. So you'll wanna make sure that you fill it out, you fill it out correctly. Um, you'll notice in the instructions at the top, um, this worksheet also includes um, calculating the credit for qualified sick and family leave wages. Um, I don't have that section snipped into this um, snipped into this presentation, um, but it as it states, if you are filing for a credit for what's also known as FFCRA wages and the employee retention credit, you'll fill out all three steps. If you're just filing for the employee retention credit, you'll fill out step one and step three. So step one is determining the employer share of social security tax this quarter after it's reduced by any um, credit that's claimed on other forms. So for most organizations, um, this is basically just gonna be determining the employer share of the social security tax, which is usually gonna be 50% of the total social security tax that's reported on the form 941. <coughs> Excuse me, in step three, you're actually gonna calculate the employee retention credit. This is where you're gonna list the qualified wages for the employee retention credit the qualified health plan expenses um, that are allocated to the qualified wages. Um, and then you're going to multiply that by 70%. Again, it's a maximum of $10,000 per employee per quarter. So the maximum credit you may be able to receive is $7,000 per employee per quarter. So this information will then um, be posted back to the form 941. So again, if you're working with a third party provider, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're keeping in touch with them and letting them know um, to please hold off on filing the return until the end of the month so that you have all the information um, and make sure that you're getting them the information they need to file this credit correctly. 
Um, here's a snippet of the Form 7200. So again, um, the, the tip is that you'll file Form 7200 if you can't reduce your employment tax deposits to fully account for the credits. So essentially you have more credits than tax deposits that you had to make. And so now you're looking for um, a refund of the, of the um, credit over the amount of your tax deposits. Um, and this is really the entirety of the credit. Um, you're going to tell them about your employment tax return, which one you're filing, um, and you're going to provide a little bit more information, and then you're going to enter your credits and the advance requested. Just know that if you file Form 7200, you're going to want to make sure that it matches the Form 941 that you eventually file for that quarter. So it's important to keep everything in sync. So again, if you have a third party um, payroll provider, they will likely not file the Form 7200 for you. I have not heard many instances where the third party payroll provider will file that. So you're going to need to file that on your own, but you're also going to need to make sure that you get this information back to your payroll provider so that they know what you filed and there aren't any mismatches down the road. So what can you be doing right now? Obviously, as we mentioned, the end of first quarter is tomorrow. So you're going to want to make sure that you have as much information ready as soon as possible so that you can either be working with your internal payroll processor or your external payroll provider. So the first step in how to prepare is first to determine if you meet one of the two qualifying tests for 2021. So that's gonna be that business operations partially or fully suspended due to government mandate. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have a copy of that government mandate in your files. Um, if you don't qualify under that test, you're gonna to wanna to do, um, do some calculations to determine if you meet that gross receipts decline test, which again is if you have gross receipts less than 80%. Basically, you need to see a 20% reduction or more um, from calendar quarter 2021 compared to that same calendar quarter in 2019. So those are the two qualifying tests. So you first have to determine if you meet one of those tests. If you do, you then have to determine which wages can be used for the credit. So I've listed here all of the um, all of the different credits and grants um, that you can't basically again we'll use the term double dipping. So wages paid under FFCRA, so that's that extended family and sick leave, um, because you are actually getting credits uh, for wages paid under FFCRA. So you can't also receive a credit for those wages for ERC. A reminder that wages used for a PPP loan received in 2021, uh, whether it's a first or a second draw loan are not eligible um, as qualified wages for the credit. Wages covered by, um, now both of these programs have not been rolled out yet, but thinking proactively, um, if you receive a shuttered venue operator grant or a restaurant revitalization fund grant and you intend to use that money to cover wages, you cannot also use those same wages to apply for the credit. And then wages used to obtain any of the other following credits are not eligible. So credit for increasing research activities, the Indian employment credit, employer wage credit for employees who are active duty um, service members, the work opportunity tax credit, and the empowerment zone employment credit. So essentially you can't be mixing all these credits together and using the same wages to apply for all of these different credit and funding opportunities. So there is actually a lot to think about. Um, especially if you are potentially receiving a shuttered venue operator grant or a restaurant revitalization fund grant. Those have the potential to be fairly substantial dollars. And so you're going to need to do a, quite a bit of tracking to make sure that you are not overlapping um, wage costs through each of these programs. So once you've determined uh, what wages are eligible, You'll complete that worksheet one from the form 941 instructions. And again, a reminder to keep that for your records. You'll provide your, this is, this is assuming that you have a third party payroll processor um, who again, you'll wanna be in contact immediately if you do determine that you're eligible for the credit. You'll wanna provide the qualified wages and health plan expenses allocable to the credit to your payroll provider prior to them filing the 941. So the nine, form 941 is due the last day of the month following the end of the quarter. So first quarter 941s are due on April 30th. 
So you'll want to be in touch with your payroll provider right away to let them know that you're eligible for the credit and that you'll be providing them the information they need to file the form timely. What we want to help people avoid is having to file a 941X, which is an amended return. Um, that process will take a little bit longer. Um, form 941Xs have to be filed on paper, um, so they can't be electronically filed, which means processing time takes substantially longer. Um, so we want to help do everything we can to ensure that your quarterly one or quarter one 941 is filed with the correct information on it so you're getting benefit as soon as possible. You'll also want to let your pro payroll provider know if you would like to apply payments to your next return or if you would like to request a refund. So again, it's all it's going to be all about communication with your payroll provider. And with that, I know we just rushed through a lot of information. Um, hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming, um, but again, you'll get this recording and you'll get the, um, the PowerPoint slides and we are available for questions. Um, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes that we can stay on. I know Melody has been ferociously answering questions while we've been on, um, but happy to, happy to stick around and answer any questions that didn't get answered um, during the presentation. Hey, one um, that I can't answer because I don't know the answer is if they deferred Social Security in 2020, can they apply the surplus credit toward that accrual? Not for 2020. So anything in 2021 is only going to be applied forward. You can't retroactively apply it backwards. Awesome. And then just to clarify, I've answered this question, but it's come up a couple of times. Can you talk about ownership and cumulative 50% being ineligible? Ownership and cumulative 50%. Well, if you, like, for instance, if you have a husband and wife who cumulatively own. Um, yes, yeah, so that I, I apologize, I meant to include that in the presentation in regards to owners. So owners of the business are not eligible wages for the employee retention credit. So that is one area where if you have a PPP loan, for example, um, and you have the employee retention credit, that's one area where the employee owner's wages would be eligible for PPP loan forgiveness, but they are not eligible for the employee retention credit. Um, affiliation rules do apply here. What that means is if you have, um, let's say in Melody's example, you have a, um, a husband that owns 100% of a business, his uh, wife and his son are also employees of the business. Because the wife and the son are affiliated with the single owner, um, their wages are also not eligible for the employee retention credit. So affiliation rules apply across a number of different um, tax law, um, and this is one area where those affiliation rules also apply. So if you have an employee owner of a business, they are not eligible their wages are not eligible for the employee retention credit. So if you are an S corporation um, and you have one employee and that's the owner, you are not eligible for the employee retention credit. So that is uh, a really important note. Um, any employees that you have that are not owners and not affiliated to the, to the owner would be eligible for the credit. But again, in that example where you are a single employee S corporation, that employee is the owner not eligible for the credit. Awesome, thank you. What about the health plan expenses? Does that include HSA? So it should include essentially all of the same health plan expenses for um, PPP. I, I reference PPP a lot because I think we've been, <laughs> we've probably done more um, webinars about PPP and, and been more invested there, but it is the employer's portion of those health insurance expenses. So yes, it's not it's not the employee's portion because that's already included in wage costs, um, but the employer's share of those expenses are included. Awesome. And um, they can still file, like if somebody's in the middle of audit season right now, while it's not ideal, they can file an amended 941 for first quarter down the road, they can. correct? Absolutely, yes. So it's it's called a Form 941X, and it is available to be filed um, at any time. So technically, when you file a 941X, you, you typically have to include a reason for why you're filing the Form 941X. 
Um, and, and the rules typically state that you are to file the Form 941X as soon as you determine that you need to file it. Um, obviously, right now with the timing, everything going on, um, whether it's taxes or you're having your annual audit done, um, or you aren't able to get in touch with your payroll provider soon enough, the ability to file the 941X will exist. Um, you can do it later on. Just know that, again, that processing time is probably going to be substantially longer because it is a paper form. So you have to file it, mail it in via paper, um, and it will take longer for the IRS to process it. Um, another note, uh, just because I've had lots of, um, lots of experience with this, it's really important if, for example, you are in a situation where maybe you weren't able to get the information timely to your payroll provider for first quarter of 2021, um, and so you're going to need to file an amended 941X uh, for first quarter 940 for first quarter 2021. And let's say you you um, because of the updated rules, you are now eligible for the employee retention credit in 2020. So you need to file 941Xs for last year. An important note: make sure you send those to the IRS separately. Do not send two or more. 941 X's in the same envelope to the IRS. They won't all get processed. You need to send them to the IRS in separate envelopes um, for each quarter that you're amending. Um, I learned the hard way many years ago <laughs> that the IRS just doesn't, they look at the first page um, and that's what they process. Anything below um, will likely get ignored. Um, so just make sure that if you are filing multiple quarters amended returns, put them in separate envelopes. If you don't mind, can we go back to the ownership question again? Because we have a number of co-ops who want to clarify how that works with co-ops and the, the total percentage. So I don't know off the top of my head if, um, if there is a percentage similar to PPP where with PPP it was 5% uh, or more owners. I'll have to clarify that. Um, for I believe it's, our, isn't it 50%? Um, 50% seems high, um, but, but we can, we can clarify that it may be 50% okay. owners, um, but we can clarify that for any of the cooperatives on the call. I just want to mention to, to keep an eye out. Um, we may be doing an additional webinar specific to cooperatives, um, that will address some of these questions directly. Um, so keep an eye out for that as well. Were the ownership rules any different in 2020? No, not that, not that I'm aware of. They, they should be the same. Again, for 2021, um, we are waiting on some additional guidance. So there was an IRS piece of guidance, it's about 100 pages long, um, called Notice 2021-20, um, where it essentially reiterated a lot of the frequently asked questions that the IRS had posted to their website. Um, but it also included some new information, uh, primarily as it relates to the Economic Aid Act, which is the bill that was signed into law back in December, um, and how some of how the employee retention credit of 2020 um, mingled with some other things. There were a few pages about how it interacted with PPP um, and the changes that came from the Economic Aid Act. Um, but for the most part, it reiterated uh, and provided examples that the IRS had previously posted on their website in the form of frequently asked questions. So we're waiting for something similar for 2021. Um, you would think now that the first quarter is ending that we would have received something. But again, the employee retention credit has been um, available since the CARES Act, uh, which was signed into law over a year ago now. Um, and we just got that 2020 guidance about two months ago. Um, so there will be additional updates, additional clarification, um, but we are waiting for, for some more specifics on the credit for 2021. This one I'm gonna read specifically because um, I don't wanna miss any of the details. If we know that X number of employees will be fully eligible and it'll take a while to cal calculate wages covered by grants in March, does it make sense to file timely for the people we know are fully eligible and amend for the others? Uh, yes, um, I would say get as much information timely on the form 941 that you can. Um, ideally, you would have all of the information 
timely. Um, I realize with some of these other credits and loan programs, there is quite a bit of analysis that has to be done. Um, we have been doing that for our clients. Um, and it's not as easy as just saying, oh, well, these wages go here and these wages go here. Um, you really have to think analytically about what bucket of wages should go into which, um, which program. And you wanna try to maximize the benefit from each of the programs, especially for those organizations and businesses that are really struggling. So yes, if you have enough information to at least file timely and get the benefit of the credit right away, I would definitely say put that information on the return and if down the line you determine that there are additional um, there are additional reasons to amend the return and get additional credit, then yes, at that time you would file the 941X. Thank you. If we qualify first quarter but not second quarter, do we only get to claim for first quarter? Yes. It, but you could end up being eligible again in the third quarter and potentially the fourth quarter. So you can be eligible just in one quarter, you could be eligible in two, three, or you could be eligible all year. Um, just remember that the maximum for each quarter is qualified wages and health plan expenses up to $10,000 and you're gonna take 70% of that. So the maximum credit per employee per quarter is gonna be $7,000. Is the worksheet one that you had available electron electronically as a fill-in form? Um, I believe if you, so if you search for um, form 941 instructions, it'll take you to the irs.gov website and the form that they have there. It's available in Adobe or a PDF viewer. And I think you can, um, I think you can fill it in, um, but it's not something that you would submit electronically. Cause again, that's just something that you would keep for your records. Um, but you can print the PDF uh, or just print it electronically to PDF. Um, and fill it in that way. And just to clarify that they compare 2021 first quarter wages to 2019 gross receipts. Correct. Gross receipts to gross receipts. Yes. Okay. Yep. And then I don't, I hate to put you on the spot, but another question came in on, can we summarize the ants questions and answers and send out? Summarize the questions and answers and send those out. Um, With the slides with the slides. Um, potentially, um, it, it may be that you can also just review the, um, review the webinar. Uh, that will be posted on the website as well. Um, Actually, that's a great solution given yeah. that we, we're doing so many yeah. of these. <laughs> um, if we were to summarize everything, it probably wouldn't happen until we're um, done with the series since we've got uh, five more of these webinars we'll be doing over the next two weeks. Um, but the, the, um, the recording will be available. Um, Emily's great about getting stuff up pretty quickly and I know she'll have the, the PowerPoint and the recording sent out pretty soon after the webinar is over and then it'll also be posted on our website um, so that you can go back and visit it at any time. Perfect. Um, clarification on the wages and double dipping. The person's typing in, I heard in another webinar that any salaries paid for by grants or funding that was not listed as excluded are eligible for ERC. That is a gray area. Um, that's really going to have to be up to the, um, the applicant's discretion. Um, I would, my personal recommendation is that the likelihood is that they are not eligible for both the credit and any other grant funding. Um, we, have, we have fairly specific guidance on PPP. There was a memorandum issued last year. Um, it was mostly applicable to our um, not not for profit organizations that are heavily grant funded. Um, but the the one thing I guess I would advise is that you look to the grant itself. Um, you review the grant paperwork, you talk with the grantor um, and see if there is any um, if there's anything in the grant paperwork that would exclude you from taking credits or taking loans. Um, in addition to a grant that is funding your salaries. Um, again, it, it's a gray area. There is not any specific guidance that says if you get, um, let's say a state grant that has nothing to do with um, COVID-19, it's just a grant that you get every year. 
um, and let's say it covers, you know, 100% of your uh, specific program wages, um, there isn't anything, any guidance that says you can't take the employee retention credit on those same wages. However, um, it's my opinion, I would advise that you're going to want to look closely at that and look closely at the grant because the last thing you want to do is jeopardize any grant dollars that you receive. Um, and there may be some conflict there. So it's a gray area. I don't have a 100% um, yes or no answer for it, but I would look to the other guidance that we've received. Um, and I, I personally would apply that same guidance. Um, um, up for one more very specific question. Yes. <laughs> our company received a PPP2 and we are currently an S Corp. Once our PPP2 is forgiven, we will convert to being a co-op. Will the co-op be eligible for ERC in the third and fourth quarters? There shouldn't be any reason that um, they wouldn't just because you're changing entity structure. Again, it would depend on whether or not you meet one of the qualifying tests. Um, and it will depend on our answer to the employee owner question about eligibility. Um, so if if you haven't submitted your email address and name in the Q&A, um, please make sure to do that so that we can make sure to follow up specifically um, with anybody that has that question. And again, um, for cooperatives on the call, I know we often have quite a few. We do intend to do um, another webinar specific for cooperatives since we know there are so many specific questions that are really only um, eligible for co-ops. Co Perfect. We got through the majority of the questions. You did an awesome job. Thank you, Kate. All right. Great. Um, well, I thank everybody for joining the webinar, um, and I'll turn it over to Emily to wrap us up. Perfect. Thank you so much, both of you. Yes, please keep an eye out for emails from us. We do have two more short webinars this week and three more next week covering all of these really important topics. So sign up for anything that is applicable to you. We just want to get this information out there. Please make sure you're keeping an eye out for the web webinar recording in the PowerPoint presentation from today. Uh, Kate and Melody, thank you so much for your expertise, and we will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thanks, ladies. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Bye.